The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Are we ready? So, good afternoon. Just a reminder, this week we see each other three times, today on Wednesday and Friday in this other lecture hall for our midterm exam. Uh, today we will finish the big chapter on light atom interaction, but we're not getting rid of it because we will be transitioning to an important aspect of light atom interaction, and these are line shifts and line broadening. So today we start the next big chapter, line shifts and line broadening. But before I do that, we have to finish light atom interaction. And uh, I want to come back to the rotating wave approximation revisited. So I revisit the revisit of the rotating wave approximation. And you know, sometimes when I have discussions with students after class, I realize that something which I sort of casually mentioned is either confusing or interesting for you. And there are two aspects I actually want to come back here. So several people reacted to that, but some felt it was maybe a little bit too complicated, or others asked me about some detail. So let me come back to two aspects, and I hope you find them interesting. One is when we sorted out all those terms, those lead to angular momentum selection rules, but I made sort of the innocent comment, well, if you have omega and minus omega in a time-dependent Hamiltonian, one term is responsible for absorption, one is for emission. And when more than one person asked me about it, I think many more than one person in class uh, would like to know more about it. So therefore, let me spend the first few minutes in explaining why is a time-dependent term in the Hamiltonian with plus or minus omega, why is one of them responsible for absorption and one is responsible for emission? Well, we have Schrödinger's equation, which says that the change of amplitude, that the change of the amplitude in state one has a term and if we start, start out with population in state two, let's say perturbation theory, we start in state two, then it is the only term where the differential equation through an off-diagonal matrix element puts amplitude from state two into state one. So what I'm writing down here is just Schrödinger's equation, and the operator V is the drive field connecting state two to state one. And so if I just integrate this equation for a short time between time t and t plus delta t, and I'm asking, did we change the population of state one, which is now our final state? Well, then you integrate over that for time interval delta t. But now comes the point that the initial state has, in, in its time-dependent wave function, a factor which is e to the minus i omega 2 t. The final state, which I called 1, has, because it's a complex conjugate, plus omega 1 t. And uh, let's just assume we have here uh, the proportionality to e to the i omega t. And let me just say omega can now be positive and negative. It will be part of the answer whether it should be positive or negative. Well, this integral here becomes an integral of e to the i omega 1 minus omega 2 plus omega t integrated with time. Well, and this is an oscillating function where if you integrate it with over time, it will average to zero unless uh, omega is equal or at least close to the frequency difference between initial and excited state. 
So actually, uh, what you encounter here is, well, what I've derived for you here is actually, you can say energy conservation. I didn't assume it. It is built into the time evolution of the Schrodinger equation that you can only go from omega one to, from state one to state two or state two to one if the drive term has a Fourier component omega, which makes up for the difference. Or I'm using different language now. If through the drive term you provide photons, you provide quanta of energy, where omega fulfills the equation for energy conservation. And you also see from this result, when, you, when omega 1 is higher than omega 2, omega has to be negative. When, when the reverse is true, omega has to be positive. So that's why I said the e to the plus i omega t term is responsible for absorption. The e to the minus i omega t term is responsible for uh, uh, stimulated emission. You also see, of course, but I stop up, I stop here because I think you have heard it often enough. If you integrate over short time delta t, uh, this equation has to be fulfilled only to within one over delta t. This is sort of the energy time uncertainty. But for short for short times, you don't have to. The photon energy does not need to have does not need to match exactly the energy difference, and you also realize. When we think about omega is close to resonance, then e to the i omega t does absorption. But if you're in the ground state, e to the minus i omega t leads now to a very rapid oscillation here, which is close to a two omega oscillation. And we've discussed that in the context of the AC Stark shift, that this gives rise to the bloch sieger shift. We've also discussed that this is uh, that this term is rapidly oscillating, and it's nothing else than the counter-rotating term, which we usually neglect when we do the rotating wave approximation. So everything we have discussed in this context, co-counter-rotating term, energy conservation, Heisenberg's uncertainty, time-energy uncertainty, all appears, in, actually comes from this kind of formalism. Any question? Of course, if you quantize the electromagnetic field, then you don't have a drive term with e to the i omega t. You just have a and a daggers for the photons. And the question which term absorbs a photon or creates a photon does not exist. Because you know it whether it's a or a dagger. But you have the two choices, whether you want to use the fully quantized field with photon operators, or whether you want to use the time-dependent formalism using a semi-classical or classical field and the Schrodinger equation. The second comment I wanted to do is, using the semi-classical picture, I was sort of going with you through some examples when the rotating wave approximation is necessary, when not, when you have counter-rotating terms. And yes, everything I told you is, I think, is the best possible way how you can, well, I assume because I haven't found a better one, the best possible way to present it and explain it to you using the time-dependent electromagnetic field. But I realized after class that it may be useful to quickly state what I have said uh, in uh, using the photon picture. If we have circular polarization, we have, for given frequency, annihilation and creation operator. But let's assume that the mode we are considering is right-handed circularly polarized, so the operator creates a photon at frequency omega with this uh, right-handed circular polarization. So that means now, if we start from a level m, and we have now light atom interaction, the operator which absorbs, which annihilates a photon with circular polarization because of angular momentum conservation can only take us to a level where the magnetic quantum number is m plus one. 
Well, the, the operator E dagger creates a photon through stimulated emission. And so this is now our two-level system. And now we should ask the question, in terms of rotating wave approximation is necessary or not, are there counter-rotating terms? Well, the counter-rotating terms are the non-intuitive terms, where you have, you start out in the lowest state, but now instead of absorbing a photon, you emit a photon. And the operator for emission is this one. So I can now ask, is there another term? Why don't we stick to the blue color for the photons? That there is a term which is driven by the operator E dagger circularly polarized. Well, the answer is there may be such a term, but the state we need is, has now a magnetic quantum number of m minus 1 because of angular momentum selection rules. So this here is the counter-rotating term, which you may or may not neglect, depending whether you want to make the rotating wave approximation or not. So therefore, if you got a little bit confused about the different cases I considered at the end of the last lecture, uh, then uh, you may just summarize the many examples I gave you in, this, in, in the lecture just as a note which you should keep in the back of your head. Namely, let me first phrase it in words and then write it down. If you have circular polarization and angular momentum selection rules, then the counter-rotating term may require a third level and is not part of two-level physics. So if you have a situation where the third level does not exist, you do not have a counter-rotating term. However, in all situations I've encountered in the lab, this third level does exist. Okay, so let me just write it down, counter-rotating term for circularly polarized radiation. requires a third level which may not exist and then you don't have this term but it does exist in most cases. Anyway, just an additional clarification to the topics we had on Wednesday. Any questions about that? Yes. Are there cases other than a spin one half system where it doesn't exist? Well, I gave you the example. Uh, I mentioned the example last class. If you do spectroscopy of an S2P transition in the magnetic field of a neutron star, then the, then the Zeeman splitting is so huge that, well, you can assume that this has been shifted so far away that it has been completely suppressed. Uh, other than that, well, we have the trivial situation, which we discussed in NMR. If we simply have spin one half, then we, the total number of levels is only two, because we're talking about spin up and spin down. Or I constructed in the last class the forbidden transition, a duplet S to duplet S state. So that's two pairs of S equals one half. And then we are missing this state to couple uh, any counter-rotating term into the system. Okay, uh, the next subject is saturation. Now, in this chapter, I want to talk about saturation in general. I want to discuss monochromatic light, but also broadband light. 
And I want to introduce concepts of uh, saturation intensity, of absorption cross-section, certain things which I find extremely useful if I want to understand what happens when light interacts with the system. And we will find, I will just sort of to whet your appetite, uh, I will sort of show you that the absorption cross-section of a two-level system is independent whether you have a strong or weak transition. Some people think the cross-section should be, but it's, but there is a difference which is important between mon monochromatic and broadband light. So if to, but in the end, the concepts are very simple. I should say sometimes I feel it's almost too simple to present it in class. Uh, on the other hand, if I don't present it, I can't make a few comments and guide you through. So my conclusion now is, at least for now, I show you some, pre some prepared slides, and I sort of step you through and make a few annotations and point out certain things. We have already partially transitioned to teach you this material through a homework assignment. This week's homework assignment, which is due on Wednesday, is almost completely on uh, saturation. And I will make a few comments where what I present you today is an extension or different from what you are learning in the homework and vice versa. So, uh, yes. If I, want, if I wanted to present you saturation, power broadening and all that in the purest form, I would just present you with the optical block equations. We can solve them and then we have everything we want. A result which explains saturation, a result which explains power broadening. However, uh, and you do some of it in your homework. However, what I want to show here is that uh, saturation is actually a general feature of a two-level system. If you have sort of three rates, which I will explain to you in a moment, very similar to Einstein's A and B coefficient, that all such systems have saturation. And then you may find, you may immediately solve the optical block equation for monochromatic radiation, but for broadband radiation, uh, we usually don't use the optical block equations because there is, for infinitely broad light, there is no coherence for which we need optical block equations. Uh, so you would, you, if you only have the optical block equations, you have solved for saturation in one limiting case, and you don't see that the concept of saturation is much broader. So therefore, let us assume that we have a two-level system, and we have, we couple two levels, uh, with a rate, which you can think of the rate of absorption, the rate of stimulated emission, and I call the rate the unsaturated rate. In addition, there is some dissipation, some spontaneous decay described by gamma. So R u is the unsaturated rate for absorption and for stimulated emission. Of course, you know even before you solve those equations that there must be some saturation built in. If you would look at the fraction of atoms in the excited state and you change the laser power, which means changing the unsaturated rate, you know, things cannot go on. Uh, Things cannot shoot up forever because you cannot put more than 100% of the population into the excited state. However, the fact that we, when we increase the laser power, we do upwards absorption and downwards stimulation means you won't even get 100%. The maximum you can get is 50%. And what I'm just drawing to for you is this is a phenomenon of saturation. And now we want to understand the details. So using this rate equation, we are defining, this is now a definition, the saturated rate is the net transfer from A to B. Well, the net transfer is, because we have an absorption and stimulated emission, the net transfer is the unsaturated times the population difference. And this is our saturated rate. 
But of course, we normalize everything per atom. So therefore, our saturated rate has a rate coefficient Rs times the total number of atoms or the total population in both states. Um, eventually, we are interested in steady state. We can immediately solve the rate equation in terms of steady state, which is done there. Uh, and we find that for those, we can now eliminate one of the states from the equation because we have the steady state ratio. And then we find that the saturated rate is gamma over 2 times an expression which involves the saturation parameter. So in other words, it's just almost you know, trivial solutions or very simple equations which describe the saturation parameter, uh, the saturation uh, the saturation phenomenon I outlined for you at the beginning. Uh, it, this solution has the two limiting cases which, are, which we want to see, that at very low power, at, at a very low unsaturated rate, the saturated rate is the unsaturated rate because there is no saturation. And secondly, if we would go to infinite power, the saturated rate becomes gamma over 2, because we have equalized the population between ground and excited state. One half of the atoms are in the excited state, and they dissipate or scatter light with the rate gamma. All right. Uh, any questions? We now want to specialize it to a situation which we often encounter, namely monochromatic radiation. And for monochromatic radiation, the unsaturated rate follows, has, well, I factored out something here, but it follows uh, the normalized line shape, uh, which is a Lorentzian. And uh, therefore, our unsaturated rate is proportional to the laser power. But I usually like to express the laser power through a Rabi frequency or the Rabi frequency squared. So our unsaturated rate follows this Lorentzian. And uh, on, on resonance, this part is 1. Our rate is omega Rabi squared over gamma. And the definition for the saturation parameter of 1 or for the saturation intensity is that the unsaturated rate has to be gamma over 2. So therefore, by omega rabi squared over gamma is the unsaturated rate. It should be gamma over 2 for saturation, for saturation parameter of 1. So therefore, our saturation parameter on resonance is given by this expression. And uh, If we use the previous result and apply it to this, unsaturated, uh, to, to this unsaturated rate, we find a saturated rate, which shows now the new phenomenon of power broadening. Let me illustrate that in two ways. The saturated rate involves the saturation parameter and the unsaturated rate as a Lorentzian. But this Lorentzian appears now in the enumerator and the denominator. So it appears twice. But with a one-step manipulation, you can transform it into a single Lorentzian. But this single Lorentzian is now power broadened. It has, it is no longer, it no longer has width of gamma over of the natural line with gamma, it has an additional term, and this is power broadening. No, it's still the resonance is at uh, zero detuning. The equations are trivial. It's really just substituting one and getting from an expression, simplifying it to single Lorentzian. Uh, to simple Lorentzian, so I can, I just want to emphasize the result. So we have, if we drive a transition, we have now uh, uh, the width of the Lorentzian is uh, now uh, gamma over 2, 
if we have no saturation, but then if we crank up the saturation parameter, the width increases with the square root of the power. That's an important result. The square root of the power leads to broadening. Now, let me give you a pictorial description of what we have done here. If we start with the Lorentzian and we increase the power, you sort of want to drive the system with a stronger Lorentzian. But we know we have a ceiling, which is saturation. And of course, when you drive it stronger, you reach the ceiling on resonance earlier than you reach the ceiling when you transfer it away from resonance. So therefore, if you start with a red curve, crank up the power, you will get more of a factor, more of a result in the wings, because you're not yet saturated there. And these graphical constructions, which, I'm, which I've just sort of indicated to you, lead now to a curve which is broadened, broader than the original Laurentian. And this is the reason behind power broadening. I want to mention one thing here. For the classroom discussion, I have assumed that the light atom interaction can be described by Fermi's golden rule, which we know is a limitation when we are not when we are, when the, when we are driving the system, when the system is in effect incoherent and no longer coherent. With a long discussion about Rabi oscillation and Fermi's golden rule uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, but what I'm doing is mathematically correct. The optical Bloch equation, which you will use in your homework assignment, really include the transition from Rabi oscillation towards Fermi's golden rule. And I'm just considering this one limiting case. OK, I've, I've talked about saturation of a transition. I've mentioned that we have defined the saturation parameter such that when we have a saturation parameter of 1, we sort of get into the nonlinear regime where saturation happens. And of course, for an experimentalist, the next question is, what, at what intensity does that happen? This is summarized in those equations. It's the simplest possible algebra. You just combine two equations. I don't want to do it here. And we have a result for the saturation intensity, which has two features, which I want to point out. One is it scales with omega cube. So the, the, more, the higher the frequency of your transition is, the harder it is to saturate. Of course, it has something to do with that in saturation, you have an unsaturated rate, which is one half of the spontaneous emission rate. And you remember that the spontaneous emission rate was proportional to omega cube. So that's why we have, again, the omega cube factor. And in addition, uh, the, the larger Actually, depends. Sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, we have <coughs> well. You can result. You can you can write the results in several ways. If you have an intensity and you go back to photons, you get factors of omega. So when I said omega cube comes from uh, from the natural line width, yes, it does, but it's not the only omega factor. You can, you can write the result, actually, that you have a gamma square dependence, because one gamma comes from the matrix element squared, and one comes because you need to compete in your excitation with spontaneous emission. So anyway, uh, this is sort of the result. And you can calculate it for your favorite atom. And for alkaline atoms, we usually find that the saturation intensity is a few milliwatt per square centimeter. Well, we can now repeat some of this exercise for the broadband case. 
in the broadband case, uh, the unsaturated rate, which is the rate for absorption and stimulated emission following Einstein's treatment of the AB coefficient, uh, is, is used by using Einstein's B coefficient times uh, the spectral intensity. And now we want the same situation as before. We want to reach saturation. And saturation happens when this is comparable with gamma. And it's purely a definition that we say it should be gamma over 2. But we are consistent with what we did before. And if you just take this equation and calculate what the saturation intensity is, well, gamma is nothing else than the Einstein A coefficient. Here we have the Einstein B coefficient. And if we take the ratio between the Einstein A and B coefficient, the matrix element, everything which is specific to the atom, cancels out. And the saturation intensity, or the spectral density, it's the spectral density now for broadband, only depends on speed of light and the transition frequency cube. And it doesn't make a difference whether you have a two-level system which has a strong matrix element or weak matrix element. I could explain it to you now at this point, but we want to hold the idea that there is a difference between single mode monochromatic and broadband excitation until I have discussed one more concept. Uh, and uh, this is the cross-section. Just to check, are there any questions? Yes, Nancy. Um, so in the broadband case, the line shape doesn't matter at all? Because in the monochromatic case, we had a line shape like right here? Well, hold your question. The line shape matters. I will now discuss what is the line shape of the atom. And the quick answer is, if the atom has a line shape, we have to take the atomic line shape and do a convolution with the, with, with, the line, with the line of the radiation. And we have the two situations where in one case the monochromatic light is narrower than the line shape of the atoms. In the other case, it's broader. And this difference in the end will be responsible for the fact that the line width of the atom, which is a, the natural line width, will cancel out in one case and not in the other. But that's actually the result of the next five minutes. Other questions? I know this, this topic can get confusing because we go from one definition to the next. So let me just summarize. What I've said so far is we drive, we drive an atom, we have absorption, we have stimulated emission, and we want to understand the phenomenon of saturation. And based on the fact how we define saturation, namely that the unsaturated rate is gamma over 2, we got some nice results for the saturation intensity and for power broadening of a Lorentzian. So it's pretty much having a definition and running with that. And now we want to express the same physics uh, by using the concept of a cross-section. You know, for the following reason. If you can, you, can, you can do physics, you can do atomic physics without, or without ever thinking about a cross-section, you can just say I have a laser beam of a certain intensity and I scatter light. But, but often when we scatter something, and you may be familiar from atomic collisions, you often want to write the scattering rate as a density times cross-section times relative velocity. And this sort of has this intuitive feeling if you have a stream of particles in your accelerator or a stream of photons in your laser beam, you can now hold on to the picture that each atom in your target is a little disk. If the particle of photons hits the disk, something happens. If it misses the disk, nothing happens. And the area of the disk is this cross-section. So in other words, we want to now understand how big is the disk of the atom which will, so to speak, cast a shadow, which is synonymous with absorption, when we illuminate those atoms with laser light. So for me, a very intuitive quantity. Uh, anyway, uh, so all we do is, uh, we have already discussed uh, the rate of excitation, which is now the unsaturated rate. But now we express the unsaturated rate by uh, 
the density of photons times the cross section and the relative velocity is the speed of light. And uh, from this equation, we find, because everything is known, we have talked about that on the last few pages, uh, we find that the cross section is, and this is the result, 6 pi lambda bar square. Lambda bar is uh, the wavelength of light divided by 2 pi. So we find that for monochromatic radiation, the cross section of a two level system is independent of the strength of the transition, independent of the matrix element. It just depends on the resonant wavelengths. <coughs> now you would say, well, but what is now the difference between a strong and a weak transition? And this is shown here. If you take your monochromatic laser and you scan it, you scan it through the cross section. When you are on resonance, you have 6 pi lambda bar square. And the difference between a narrow transition with a small Einstein A coefficient and a strong transition with a large Einstein A coefficient simply means that in one case it's narrower, in the other case it's wider. Uh, we talked about the phenomenon of saturation. 6 pi lambda bar square is the cross section in the perturbative limit or the unsaturated cross section. Of course, if you increase the laser power, you saturate the transition, the atom will have a smaller and smaller cross section. Actually, that's something important uh, you should consider. When you have an atom and you increase the laser power, you scatter light, and the scattered light or the absorbed light saturates. But with the cross-section, we want to know what fraction of the laser light is scattered. And the fraction of the laser light scattered goes to zero because you make your laser light stronger and stronger, and the total amount of laser light which is scattered saturates. So in other words, you have a saturation of the scattered light, you have, a you have a saturation of the net transfer of atoms to the excited state in the limit of infinite laser power. But since the cross section is sort of normalized by the laser power, the cross section has this dependence 1 over 1 plus saturation parameter and goes to zero. And that means and this is sort of the language we use, that the transition bleaches out. If you saturate the transition, the cross-section becomes smaller. So when you saturate the transition in an absorption imaging experiment, which many of you do, the shadow is less and less black exactly because the cross-section is bleaching out. But the amount of light you would scatter, you would observe in fluorescence, is not getting less, it saturates. These are sort of just the two flip signs of the coin. If anybody is confused, please ask a question. OK. Uh, so now, in this picture, we can immediately understand why we have differences between monochromatic radiation and broadband radiation. If you want to saturate a transition with monochromatic radiation, we have our narrow laser. We absorb with a cross-section 6 pi lambda bar square, and we have to increase the intensity of the laser until the excitation rate equals gamma over 2. That's our definition for saturation. And this, uh, so therefore, uh, the laser intensity is proportional to gamma because we have to, we have the cross section is constant, but the product of cross section and laser intensity has to be equal to gamma over 2. However, now consider the case that you use broadband radiation. The spectrum is completely broad. Now, if an atom has a stronger transition, its cross-section is wider 
and the atom can sort of absorb a wider part of the incident spectrum. So therefore, if the atom has a stronger transition, uh, it automatically takes, absorbs more of your spectral profile, and therefore the result for the saturation, for the saturation in, for the spectral saturation intensity is independent of the matrix element and the strength of the transition. So in general, if you if you're not in either of the extreme cases of monochromatic light or broadband light, what you have to do is you have to use this cross-section as a function of frequency and convolve it, do a convolution with the spectrum of the incident light. And this is exactly done here. You take your frequency-dependent cross-section, uh, you do the convolution with the spectrum of the incident light, and if you assume the incident light is spectrally very broad, uh, you can, you simply do, you, you, you integrate, you integrate over uh, the Lorentzian line shape of the cross section, and then you find exactly the same result as we had two slides ago, that the saturation intensity is independent of the strength of the transition. Okay, does can you think of a very intuitive argument why for spec uh, why for spectrally broad radiation all the properties of the atoms cancel out? If you think about one physical example for, let's say, black body radiation, this is spectrally broad. So you have an atom in a black body cavity, and it, the atom experience a very broad spectrum. Can, how would we, for, for what number of photons, black body photons per mode, would we find saturation? Think about it. Is there a simple criterion you can formulate for black body radiation to saturate your transition in terms of the number of photons per mode? You crank up the temperature in your cavity. How high do you have to go with the temperature in order to saturate an atom which is inside your black body ready, inside your black body cavity? Pretty close. Degeneres. Okay, no degeneres. I hate degeneres. That's. That's your private homework to put in the genesis afterwards. Uh, the answer I came was n equals one half, I think. Because you, I run the risk that I'm off by a factor of two now, but the argument was that gamma over Yes, okay. So spontaneous emission, we know that spontaneous emission from our derivation of spontaneous emission corresponds to one photon per mode. And, uh, and, we want a, and our criterion now is that we want to have an absorption rate or stimulated rate, which is gamma over two. So we get sort of half the effect of spontaneous emission when we have a half a photon per mode. 
So therefore, uh, spontaneous emission absorption is proportional to n. And I think if n equals 1 half, then we have the unsaturated rates are equal to gamma over 2. So this is a very physical argument. When we put an atom into a black body cavity and we have half a photon per mode occupation number, then we saturate any atom we put in because using Einstein's argument, we have now the rate coefficient for absorption and emission is just for stimulated emission and absorption is just one half of the rate coefficient for spontaneous emission. And that explains that all atomic properties have to cancel out. So now, uh, question for you. We talked about the fact that if you have hyperfine transitions, that it would take, what was the value, 1,000 years for spontaneous emission? But so that we can ne completely neglect spontaneous emission. On the other hand, we've just learned that saturation only comes from spontaneous emission. Without spontaneous emission, we wouldn't have saturation. But now I'm telling you that any atom should really be saturated if we put it in a black body cavity where n bar is one half. So what is the story now if we put an atom into cavity, uh, sorry, into black body cavity, and we're asking about will we saturate the hyperfine transition? Will we eventually have saturation means we have a quarter of the atoms in the excited state, three quarters in the ground state. So the, the delta N has been reduced from one, which it was initially, to three quarters minus one quarter, which is one half. Uh, what will happen? I mean, this was almost like a thermodynamic argument. Will we equilibrate and saturate hyperfine transitions in a black body cavity? based on this argument that for n bar equals 1 half, we should really, read, we should really saturate everything. Yes, but it's an equivalent. Yeah. So for those conditions, if you have a black body cavity with n bar equals 1 half, you should saturate any two-level system completely independent what gamma is. And if the gamma is 10 nanoseconds or 10,000 years, you will saturate it. The, the, the value of gamma has <coughs> completely dropped out of the argument. But of course, if you want to reach any kind of equilibrium, it, it will take a time scale, which is 1 over gamma, and then we are back 2,000 years. Questions? All right, then let's conclude this chapter and start our discussion about line shifts and line broadening. a problem with the tablet computer. I draw a line, but the computer draws the line somewhere else. So maybe I should just go back to this one and then copy things over. OK, our next big chapter is line shifts and broadening. So the first question is motivational. Why should we be interested in line broadening? Well, the answer is almost trivial. No resonance has, is infinitely narrow. Whenever we want to interpret any result we obtain spectroscopically, we are not observing a delta function, we are not observing a resonance, we are observing a line shape. And unless we understand the line shape, we may not accurately find the resonance frequency. 
You could, of course, assume that your line shape is symmetric, which may be the case, but it's not always the case. So without understanding line broadening, you cannot interpret spectroscopic in information. And uh, eventually, as I mentioned in the first chapter of this course, the art of analyzing line shapes and finding the line center is, quite, is, is, is very well advanced. Uh, when we have cesium fountain clocks, uh, the accuracy, how you operate the clock as a frequency standard, is on the order of one microhertz. But those fountain clocks with you toss up the atoms for one second in an atomic fountain, they fall up and down well like a rock, which takes about a second for a rock to go up and down a meter. So therefore, the line width is on the order of one hertz. So therefore, people have to understand every, any single aspect of the line shape uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 to have this kind of accuracy. OK, uh, so I thought I want to start this unit by collecting from you examples for phenomena which cause broadening and shifting of lines. And well, my list has about 10 of them. Let's see how many you get. So what, in, what phenomena can lead to line shifts and line broadening? Phonons in terms of, OK, AC Stark effect. Pardon? Magnetic field noise. OK, I try to, yes, very good. Uh, OK, yes. Let me just try to group it a little bit for, because I want to discuss it. So we have external fields. And external fields uh, can have AC stark shifts. If an external field is noisy, we have noise fluctuations. All right. Anything else? Doppler, Doppler shift. Yes, so we have. the velocity of the atoms. Doppler shift. Collisions. Collisions. Very good. Well, we just talked about one thing. Exactly, when we have external fields, we can have external fields like magnetic fields or electric fields, which cause shift and broadening. And if there's noise, additional shifts. But when we regard those fields as drive fields, uh, they can do power broadening. Maybe by collisions. I should add the keyword pressure broadening. The higher the pressure in your gas cell is, the more collisions you have, and the more you have broadening. Other suggestions? If you, have, if you don't have any of those effects, do you measure delta function? What's the line, what's the line width? Will? 
spontaneous emission. Yes. And if you don't have spontaneous emission, do you then measure delta function? The Fourier limit, you can call it observation time or time of light broadening. If an, if an atom flies through your laser beam and you can interrogate it only for finite time, you have broadening due to the Fourier theorem. And this can be called time of light broadening, time of <coughs> or inter-action time broadening. Rotations and vibrations, not really. These are more then the then the system has more energy levels, and that's what you want to find out. So maybe I'm more asking how how are those energy levels? How do they appear spectroscopically? Well, I think that's pretty complete. Uh, two external fields, if you want, you can add gravity. There is a gravitational redshift. Which is general relativity. But anyway, let me look over that and try to categorize it. Uh, what we had here is actually all comes from a finite observation time. Either we do not have the atom long enough in our laser beam, and that sets the limit. Or if you are interested in an excited state, and the excited <laughs> state decays, then the atoms themselves has terminated our interrogation time. Uh, the second class here, velocity, I would summarize that we have motion of the atom. It's a form of motional, prop um, of motional narrowing, of, of motional broadening. Uh, we will actually discuss, uh, when we discuss motion, also the possibility of having atoms in a harmonic oscillator potential, ions in an ion trap. So these are now trapped particles. This will actually often give rise to a splitting of the line into sidebands. So we want to discuss that. Uh, we, I've already mentioned external fields, collisional, uh, gravitational saturation, power broadening. Uh, some power broadening will actually result into a splitting of line into mono, mono triplet. So power will not only broaden the line, it can also split the line. And we want to discuss that. Uh, and finally, we have uh, the effect of atomic interactions. So for interactions, I think we should add something like mean field shifts. which also goes sometimes by the name of clock shifts. If you're if you're not at zero density, your transition can be shifted by the presence of other atoms. Uh, Will? <laughs> Isn't the collisional broadening of vector broadening sort of just an ensemble average of a circuit F? So it's sort of an external That depends now. It's actually collisions is one of the richest phenomena on the list here. Uh, you're ahead of me, but uh, in the next few minutes, I wanted to actually say, well, maybe we should, uh, those categories are not mutually exclusive, because one part of collisions is an atom is in the excited state. It col collides. It gets de-excited. So then collisions, 
have no other effect than so to speak give us a finite observation time or there is an effective you know, lifetime which is just the time between two collisions. So it can be this. There is another aspect of collisions that every time there is a collision an atom feels the electric field of another atom and then we have some form of collisional broadening because we do some statistical averaging over over Stark effects, over level shifts. Now, there is a third aspect of collisions which is maybe surprising to many of you. And this is actually, I put it here under motion, it is collisional narrowing. Or Dickey narrowing. There is one famous, one limiting case when you have collisions that collisions lead to a narrower line and not only to a broader line. Well, the reason is a little bit, if you put an atom in a buffer gas and it collides with all the buffer gas atom, it cannot fly away. So it has, so buffer gas and collisions can sort of help to increase the observation time but only if the other effects of collisions are absent. So anyway, I thought this is a number of really interesting effects and you already see from my presentation and discussion that it makes perfect sense to discuss them not one by one as they appear in other chapters, but try to have a comprehensive discussions of those. Let me... Uh, talk about one classification of those uh, shifts and broadening. And uh, one is the distinction between homogeneous and and inhomogeneous broadening. So the picture here is that if you have, I'll just give you the cartoon picture, if you have different atoms, atom one, atom two, atom three, hom a homogeneous broadening situation is if the line has been broadened for each atom in the same way. An inhomogeneous broadening situation is that uh, atom one has a line here, atom two has a line here, atom three has a line there. And if you look at the statistical ensemble, you may find the same line width as on the left hand side, but the situation is, and the mechanism, is a very different one. So, the different characteristics are that here we have a mechanism which broadens or widens the line for each atom, whereas here there is maybe no, not even any line broadening for the atom. It's more a random shift to individual atoms and the widening happens for the ensemble. Another very important distinction is in the left case if you have one powerful laser it can talk to all the atoms Whereas in the right hand side, you may have a laser with a certain frequency and it may only excite one group of atoms in your example, in your ensemble. So this is the opposite here. Uh, in many situations, 
we, do we have a physical picture where an homogeneous broadening, we can understand it as random interruptions of the phase as evolution of the atom. Uh, for instance, through spontaneous emission, or you can say certain collisions just mean the phase of the excited state is suddenly perturbed, and therefore the phase is randomized. So if the physical picture is a random interruption of the phase evolution, well, a random interruption of a phase evolution means that there is an exponential decay of coherence. And the line shape, the Fourier transform of an exponential decay is a Lorentzian. Whereas the physical picture behind inhomogeneous broadening is that you have random perturbations. And if you have many random or small perturbations, they often follow a normal distribution, which is a Gaussian. There is one other aspect of an inhomogeneous broadening. If it's an inhomogeneous broadening, it is as if the individual atom is not broad. And the individual atom is actually sharp and has a longer coherence. And you can, there are techniques uh, to make that visible. And uh, one famous technique for those of you who have heard about it are uh, an echo technique. So, Having explained to you in, in a general way uh, the difference between inhomogeneous and homogeneous broadening, uh, how would you classify the line broadening mechanisms we have collected before? So or which one are inhomogeneous broadening? Doppler broadening. We exploit that when we do saturation spectroscopy in the lab, when we just talk to one component of the velocity distribution. <coughs> what else? Collisions. Collisions. That's actually a good one. Uh, Usually collisions are classified as homogeneous broadening because the simplest model for collisions is collisions are sort of just hardcore collisions which just de-excite the atom, completely change the coherent phase evolution, and therefore collisions uh, would broaden the transition for all atoms by one, but to, uh, with a, to a line width which is one over the collision rates. However, and this shows that the distinction is not, cannot always be made, you can actually have collision rate which depends on the velocity. The faster atoms may have a smaller collision cross-section than the slower atoms, and now you have an inhomogeneous aspect of the collision rate, and therefore collision rate becomes inhomogeneous. Uh, I mean, the standard example for inhomogeneous fields would, if you have uh, if you have an inhomogeneous magnetic field, you have stationary atoms, well, not in an atomic gas, but maybe in a lattice or in a solid, and you have an, an inhomogeneous magnetic field. This is actually the standard case of nuclear magnetic resonance, that each atom possesses at its local magnetic field, and the line shape is inhomogeneously broadened. Colin? If the density is constant, you would actually say the mean field is the same for all atoms in the ensemble. But if we have a trapped atom sample where the density drops at the edge, you may actually have a sharper line and less broadening or less shift at the edge of the cloud. Anyway, so I think you have all the tools to classify it, and you see from the discussion that sometimes it's not so obvious or in 
or you may have a mechanism which has both a homogeneous aspect that it does something to all atoms. So for instance, collisions broaden all the atoms, but then different atoms are more broadened than others. So there may be also an inhomogeneous aspect. Uh, but finally, let me ask you the following. It seems the first uh, items on our list had sort of a very natural explanation in terms of the Fourier theorem that, well, we only talk to the atoms for a finite time, or the atoms decide not to talk to us for longer because they spontaneously decay. Now, maybe you want to give me some arguments why some of the other mechanisms are actually also due to some form of finite time of interrogation. Well, if I would say, can we regard collisions as an effect of finite observation time? Well, if I rephrase observation time to finite coherence time, that something interrupts the coherent evolution of the wave function, I think we would say the collision time is, sets a time limit to the coherence time, and therefore should also be regarded as due to the finite time we can drive the atom in a coherent fashion. If I take power broadening, we just discussed power broadening. Well, what is the, what is the rate, or one over the rate, of power broadening? We just discussed that, uh, that's maybe nice to take it out of the context. We discussed before that power broadened line width is gamma over <coughs> 2 times s plus 1 square root of it, the saturation parameter. But when does power broadening happening? And what is the real time scale for? What is the physical spontaneous? So we had a criterion that the unsaturated rate has to be comparable to gamma. Let's forget about factors of two now. But that means that the Rabi frequency has to be comparable to gamma. The Rabi frequency tells us the time of Rabi flopping. So actually, power broadening can be understood as a finite observation time broadening, but the atom is just going, it, it, the atom is leaving the excited state, not by spontaneous emission, but by stimulated emission. So in, in other words, stimulated emission interrupts our ability to observe the atoms in the excited state. And so again, we see that there is a process coming in which interrupts our observation time of the unperturbed atomic levels. Well, let me go one step further. Let me ask you, can you, do you have any idea how we could discuss the Doppler shift as due to some finite time scale? You would say, well, yeah, that's dimensionless analysis. If you have a broadening, a broadening is a frequency. One over the frequency is a time, and there is a time scale associated with Doppler broadening. Sure, but now my question is, what is the physical time scale with Doppler broadening? Yes? No, we can have, we have Doppler broadening. We have an ideal gas without any collisions. Just the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. You're right in practice, yes, but I try to create an idealized situation. So what is the time scale of Doppler broadening. You may never heard the question, but this is for me what I want to really teach you when I teach uh, you know, all these different line shifts and line broadening. There is a common denominator. Yes? 
Uh, you're talking about recoil shifts and the atom is changing its velocity due to recoil. Uh, this would something in addition, but it's not necessarily the case here. Um, I can always, I give you a physical argument. If I make the atom heavier and heavier and heavier, the effect of the recoil vanish. But then I can heat up the heavy atom that it moves with the same velocity as the slow atom. So there is an effect which you can associate just to the velocity and to the velocity distribution, and that's what I want to discuss now. But there is another effect with the recoil. But I can say the recoil is a finite mass effect for that purpose. The mass is sort of my handle, whether the recoil of a single photon is important or not. Yes. Yes, but this is really a more, more trivial finite observation time. When you hit the wall of the chamber, it's a collision with the chamber. It means we have only a finite interaction size. Now, let me sort of guide you to that. The secret here is when we say we have a finite lifetime, a finite observation time. What matters when we do spectroscopy is the time we can observe the atoms coherently. If the atoms Phase if the atoms get out of coherence. For instance, if you have collisions, if collisions de excite the atom, we talk about it later, it's like spontaneous emission. But then there are collisions which just create a phase heat up that the excited state gets a random phase. So an interruption of the phase, an interruption of the coherent evolution is in effect an interruption of us probing the atoms in a coherent way. And then the Fourier transform just tells us this time or one over this time is the line which we observe. And you would say, but how does it come into play with atoms with a velocity distribution? In the following way. If you line up several atoms and they interact with a laser beam, some atoms are faster, some atoms are slower. If some of the atoms have moved compared to the slower atoms one additional wavelength, then your ensemble of atoms is no longer interacting with the laser beam in a phase coherent way because of their different velocities. They are now talking, about, they are now talking to random phases of the laser. So therefore, Doppler broadening is nothing else as a loss of the atoms to coherently interact with the laser because some of them have moved an, an additional wavelength in the laser beam. Well, if that is true, but what happens if the laser beam is like this with the wavelengths and the atoms go perpendicular? What happens then? then there is no Doppler effect. So what I'm saying is fully consistent with every single thing you know about the Doppler effect. OK. Uh, so I think there's not much more we can do today. Uh, but let me give you the summary of this discussion. To the best of my knowledge, all line broadening mechanisms can be described by using the concept of coherence time. And it's a coherence time of a correlation function. It's pretty much the correlation function of the phase which the atom experiences. At t equals 0, it, it experiences one phase of your drive field. And at a later time, how long does it stay coherent with the coherent evolution of the phase of your drive field of a correlation function? However, in the case of inhomogeneous broadening, And this is what I just discussed with the different atoms starting together and having different velocities. In the case of inhomogeneous broadening, 
uh, I have to in include in the description of the correlation function ensemble averaging. So this is our agenda. On Wednesday, uh, I will start to discuss with you very simple cases. I sort of like, before I introduce correlation function with the generalized discussion, to summarize for you the phenomen phenomenolo phenomenological description of just Rabi resonance, Ramsey resonance, exponential decay, simple, pro simple Doppler broadening, the recoil effect, that you have a clear physical picture of what the different phenomena are, and then we describe them with a uh, common language, with a common formalism, which is a formalism of correlation functions. Any questions? One obvious question, the chapter on line shifts and broadening will not be on the midterm. Okay, see you on Wednesday.